Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster. Today, we're answering your fashion questions. I asked on Instagram for people to just send me nuanced fashion questions, and we got a lot of really good ones. So, let's just start. Do you think the oversaturation of celebrities wearing Rick Owens and Demna Vesalia will affect their legacy and inevitably undermine how great their work really is? That's a really good question. So I, I think it's important to first of all specify that celebrities and people of note have been a part of the fashion industry since its inception. Because the internet is a relatively new thing, it's really easy to feel like this whole like celebrity culture in style has like just started up, but it really hasn't. I mean, why is the Kelly called the Kelly? It's because of Grace Kelly. <laughs> right now I'm reading the biography of Tommy Nutter, the Savile Row suit maker. He was the guy that made all the suits that the Beatles wore on the cover of Abbey Road. I mean, he was working 60, 70 years in the past and a massive, massive part of his business was we gotta get these clothes on celebrities. And I mean, even if you go back to the beginning of what we would like call the beginning of modern fashion with like, uh, the House of Worth, or, you know, way back with Rose Bertin making dresses for Marie Antoinette. Those designers were making clothes that could only be afforded by royalty, essentially. And the only way that they got more business was if they were able to dress someone who was important enough that they would then get recommended to lesser royalty people and then dress them also. It's just kind of always been a thing. I understand the, the core of your frustration, though. You could be like, I started wearing Rick Owens seven years ago, and then, you know, Playboy Cardi picked up on it, and now it seems like every like lame teenager that I don't want to be associated with is also wearing Rick Owens. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing a little bit here that that's where the, the motivation for this question is coming from. I could be off there. But if, if that is where that feeling is coming from, you just got to not worry about it. And I mean, like the way that I distinguish myself apart from the group of people who are just kind of following a trend is that um, I don't wear Ramones. I don't wear Geo Baskets. I don't wear pieces by Rick Owens that are extremely well-known. Because if I'm being totally honest, the thing that I like about Rick is that he doesn't just have one or two or five designs that are really noteworthy. He has hundreds. There are hundreds of garments that have been made by Rick Owens that are incredibly special pieces of clothing. And that's what I go for. I don't like seek out a specific piece by him. I just kind of wait until something that I think is really special and that's within my price range just kind of floats into my periphery and then I say, yeah, this will be Mark Owens piece. I don't think designers are ever going to move away from this place where they look for celebrities to bolster their brand and kind of get them more popular. That's ultimately a, a way for them to make money. So I, I don't think they're ever going to stop doing that system. So as you know, the cool people that you and me are. We have to kind of figure out ways to make peace with that. And I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with the fact that there's lots of, you know, teenagers that are just really into wearing hype stuff. I, I don't think that that should undermine how much we enjoy brands and designers that we really truly love on a, a deep level. As a young fashion designer, how can you become more critical of your own work? So I get reached out to by a lot of young fashion designers asking for feedback about their work or being asked questions like this where you're kind of looking at your own process in a little bit more of a deep way. And I usually start those conversations off by asking, how many garment prototypes have you completed in the last three months? Usually the answer is something like two or four. And then I, in a very respectful and loving way, say, you need to be producing more work. It's really easy, and I can, I can speak about this with experience. I wanted to be a writer for a super long time. I wanted to be a stylist for a super long time. I don't think it's any mystery on this channel that I have no experience in actual fashion design. But the temptation with a lot of creative efforts is to fall in love with the idea of being a fashion designer or a writer or whatever. And then when it comes to the actual process of doing the thing, not a lot gets done. A lot of the questions that I get asked by young fashion designers can be answered by doing more work. How can I find my true voice in fashion design? You need to make more work. How can I become more critical of my own work? You need to be conscious about the stuff that you've just finished making, and then you need to make more work. There's a lot of tricks that your brain can play on you to try to trick you out of just getting back to work, and you have to fight them. I believe in you. You can do it. Do you think Eddie Slimane would be good at Margiela? No, I don't. Typically, when selecting a creative director, a house would want to find someone where they feel like that person is able to expound upon and dramatically change but still be in the spirit of the original designer. There's some houses like Louis Vuitton where it's like, you know, if, if we're talking about the clothes that are coming out of this house, 
that's not really part of the original legacy of what that house was about. And so it's sort of up to whatever creative director is in there to take the reins and to kind of paint a vision of what they want the house to be. But for a house like Margiela that has such a clear original vision for the clothes and accessories and everything, uh, you would want to find a designer that really is able to understand the nuances of that stuff and then take it into a new place while remaining faithful to what the house is about. I think John Galliano is doing a pretty good job of that. I have two videos up now where I talk about that in a lot more depth. And I mean, I have a whole video where I talk in depth about what Eddie is doing as a designer, but um, I, I do think the common th commonly stated thing about him is true in that he goes into a house and he just kind of turns it into himself. And I think that would be kind of a shame to happen at a house like Margiela. But no, just to answer the question directly, uh, I do not think Eddie Slaman would be good at Margiela. Do you think fashion has any sincerity left in it? That is a pretty good question. So we talked about sincerity versus iron. Well, hang on. I guess I should set this up for everybody. The way that this typically gets talked about in art criticism is um, there's, there's two polar opposites. There's sincerity and then there's irony. And since the beginning of the modern world, we've gotten less and less sincere and more and more ironic at least as far as the arts is concerned. Like a good example of this is like, you know, there are countless Instagram accounts that um, their, their whole job is just to make fun of or try to tear down fashion stuff. And they're just constantly like ripping on designers and like telling people that their stuff sucks. And those accounts are very popular. They do a lot of numbers. And the fact that they don't spend any time talking about like, wow, I am just so in love with this collection right now. This stuff is so beautiful. I mean, just like, look at these, this is just, Wow, this is so stunning. Because having a reaction like that is sincere. It's sincerity. And it just feels more natural for a lot of people to just be ironic and to tear stuff down. And in a lot of ways, artists are protecting themselves against that. If you are, as an artist, you're, if you're being too sincere and just saying like, wow, I'm just so in love with the idea of this, then the fear is that it makes you look like you're so caught up in your own fantasizing about an idea that you're not grounded in the real world. And so, no, I mean, like, the, the trap that we've kind of set up for ourselves is that uh, most things are ironic right now. I go into a lot of detail about this in my review of Demna Vesalius' first haute couture collection for Balenciaga. That's definitely worth checking out if you want to learn more about the irony-sincerity debate. But no, I mean, to answer it simply, do you think fashion has any sincerity left in it? I, th I think there is very little. Can fashion be immaterial and still create resonance, assert power, or communicate identity? I think what this is asking about is like the metaverse conversation. This is such a dominant conversation right now. Here's the deal. I think a lot of the conversation about digital fashion is speaking about it as if it's going to somehow replace fashion or become a part of fashion. And I don't see that happening. I always say on this channel that I'm terrible at predicting the future, but I, I really don't see a way for those two things to conflate. They're always going to be separate things. And that doesn't mean that we have to set up some kind of system whereby one is better than the other. I think they're just two things that serve two different purposes. Like if you think about like animation versus live action films, is animation the future of the film industry? And the answer to that would be like, I mean, kinda? Like it depends on what you mean. Uh, in, in Japan, the animation market is massive. Um, in the United States, it's not as massive. It's a part of the overall animation industry, but it's by no means going to replace it. And there's going to be some people out there who are like, I will never watch an animated movie ever. I'm, I'm just not interested. And then there's going to be people like me where it's like, if it's up to me in my own free time and I just get to pick what I'm watching, it's probably going to be anime. Digital fashion can do a lot of things, but it is limited only by the imagination of the person creating it. Whereas real fashion is a monument to creative compromise because having an idea in fashion is great, but bringing that idea into existence, that is very, very hard to do. I'll get into that more when we do an episode about digital fashion, but that's all I'll say about it for now. Do you feel like there are still subcultures emerging and designers pulling from that? I'm really not sure what to make of this conversation about subcultures. We've been talking off and on about this for the past few months on the channel, and I've really appreciated the discussion. I, I don't know what I think about this. I really don't know the answer to that question. I would love for everybody to get down into the comments and sort of share what your thoughts are about that question. Again, it is, do you feel like there are still subcultures emerging and designers pulling from that? I don't know, like, did the internet kill off subcultures completely? Uh, are there still subcultures? Like, are, are, is it only possible to have a subculture 
in a way that's not on the internet? Like are the only subcultures things that just no one is advertising publicly? Like nobody is being like, check out my cool fit from my subculture that I am a part of that has a lot to do with music, but also creativity and the arts. Cause yeah, it does seem like all of the things like that were like, you know, like this Y2K trend thing. Uh, I mean, whatever kind of subculture there was around that, it has been uh, fully made available at Target. <laughs> and it just sort of seems like a, almost like a self parody at this point, kinda, right? So yeah, I don't really know. I would love to hear what you all think. What do you judge slash rate more in a fashion show? The actual concept or the end product? So that's a great question and the answer is uh, a disappointing one. It depends. <laughs> I know, I hate it when people say it depends. Ultimately, I mean, here's the deal. Every critic of any art medium is going to have their taste. You know, like for anybody who watches like Dunkey, like if they watch video game reviews, Dunkey clearly has a set of things that he is looking for in a game. And if a game doesn't have those things, he's probably just not gonna like it or he's not gonna play it in the first place. But in the same way, like I, I would never try to pitch myself as being like, I am the great like arbiter of objective taste and like what is quality in fashion. I have my specific nuance and taste and the things that I like. And what I personally like in fashion a whole lot is really good storytelling. Nuance symbolism, really elaborately well-executed references, these are things that get me really excited about clothes. There are plenty of other critics who are like, I am only interested, and this is a legitimate way of looking at it. They, there are lots of critics who, not lots, there are not lots of fashion critics, but like there is a critic or two where they're like, I am pretty much only interested in the narrative of fashion as it relates to the role of women in society. That is a perfectly legitimate way to look at fashion. But for me, the storytelling is the thing that comes first. Now, I get a little bit disappointed if I'm like, man, the runway show and the lookbook and the show notes and like what you were doing in that presentation was so compelling. And then I go and I look at your products and it's just not there. That is heartbreaking to me. I do not like that. And it's really, I mean, it, it should absolutely be celebrated when a designer can do both. And I mean, like, I'm sure the people who watch this channel all the time are sick of hearing me say this, but like Rick Owens really stands alone in this regard. I mean, if you see crazy stuff by him on the runway, that stuff is going to the stores and it is for sale. But yeah, I guess I, I, I do tend towards really appreciating designers that are doing both things. But at the end of the day, my number one priority is really good fashion storytelling. So if someone really told a, an incredible, compelling story that was just in their runway, and I know that probably not many of those clothes are ever gonna go to sale, I'm at least gonna be tempted to cover it because that's just what my taste is as a critic. But yeah, thank you so much for joining me. Go uh, join that Patreon so that you can get on the Discord server and uh, make fashion friends. I, I don't have a lot of, uh, even, even I, folks, I do not have a lot of fashion friends IRL, and I would go absolutely crazy if I did not have that Discord server. It is really refreshing to not just be like reading tweets or seeing, you know, strangers post on Instagram, but like to be able to be engaged in conversation with people who are also really in love with this stuff. But yeah, thank you so much for joining me. I will uh, I will talk to everybody soon. Love oh wait, go, hey, go follow me on Instagram and Twitter. The number of subscribers that I have here in comparison to the number of Instagram followers that I have is, is sad. Y'all are fucking up my ratio. Go follow me on Instagram, please. It's just my name, it's just Bliss Foster. I love you so much, goodbye.